Hello, welcome back to Karma, Destiny and Choice. We are here in the studio with Sister Denise, who's taking us through these extremely fascinating topics. And um, what we aim to do in this series is to try to understand, not only to grasp the law of karma, but how to apply it practically in one's life. Today we'll be looking at the subject of the interface between destiny and choice. Hello, Sister Denise, and welcome. Hello. Uh, destiny and choice. This is a conundrum for both young and old. And um, there are some who believe they are the victims of destiny. There's nothing they could have done to, for this and this to happen, whereas others are fully pro-choice. There is um, nothing but choices. There is no such thing as destiny. Um, could you take us through that? One of the things that people do is compartmentalization, which means that in their minds they create a sort of wall and for certain circumstances destiny and then for other circumstances choice. And because there's a wall they don't feel the contradiction. Um, because they use them in different types of circumstances. But what we need to do is work with the paradox because we have to be able to include. It has to be both and, not either or. One thing I think about or analogy I use for it is that it's like when you're walking along, you have a left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. You could say something like, the left foot is destiny, mm. the right foot is choice. So there are certain moments where you just feel that there's absolutely no choice that you have, there's nothing you can do, you have to accept the circumstances as they are. And yet there are other moments where circumstances themselves stand back and call upon you to do something. and time or circumstances or the way the world is, the way life is, seems to be like that. And we have to be able to work with this both and, and not the either or. I think that when people are stuck in either or, they're very rigid in their minds and we do have to be very flexible. Sometimes people think that if you're not rigid, you're not logical but it's not really so because paradox is not illogical. There's a difference between something that doesn't make any sense and something that's paradoxical. Destiny is anyway there, but you don't know it. One, one uh, way that you can look at it is um, your destiny is your role, it's your part in the drama. Like in, in Hollywood, people are actors, they play roles in movies. They could be the hero, the villain, a side character, uh, all kinds of possibilities. And in the drama of life, there are many characters that have to be played. And we will get the character that corresponds to some very important at attribute of us. Sometimes when people tell me they don't like their role, I point out to them that, well, you know, you could have had a role as a psychopath or a villain or whatever. You'd be happy that you have a, an acceptable role. And, and your role does correspond with who you are as well as it um, disturbs you because um, you may have some ideas about yourself that are not true you don't quite understand yourself, you don't understand your foibles, you don't understand your weaknesses. If you look at the part you play as a detached observer, this is another important practice, you know, being a detached observer. You have a role that you play, okay, there's a role, it's a circumstance. Uh, you have that role, but how you play it, that's up to you. When someone is at an important point in their lives and um, 
is faced between uh, this is what I believe my destiny to be. Uh, I do not have a choice or do I have a choice? Uh, how does one go about making a decision that is um, in line with uh, what I call the authentic self? I think there's a difference between how you are, what it means to be your particular self. And then sometimes when people um, take up the word destiny, they refer to some quite um, major sort of news headline aspect of themselves and call that their destiny. But um, I, don't, I don't think it's useful to think of destiny like that because your destiny isn't really clarified until you're dead anyway. By that time it's history. While you're moving towards your death, you're creating yourself and you're, you're following along a track which with hindsight you would say is destiny. But I, d I don't think it's realistic in most cases to say, well, this is my destiny, therefore I'm going to do this, this and this. You don't know. If I think about my destiny, I will look at it very much in terms of my capacity and then put together my capacity with my relationship with God and say, okay, God, this is me as is. Whatever you want to do with it, you do it. If you want to take it high, take it high. I can manage it. If you want to take it middle, okay, I can manage it. If you want to take it low, I can manage it. So it's a kind of dispassion, but at the same time to be ready for something that will require extraordinary capacity. And then if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But you make yourself ready that it could happen, and then maybe it will happen. You touched on this just now in your answer, but I'd like more details. How do you include the divine in your decision-making process? And before you get there, should one do that? And what is the difference between somebody who's quite sensible and grounded and makes their own decisions and draws on their own intellects, or that of somebody wiser, a human intellect, and drawing on divine assistance? What is um, the difference as far as the consequences are concerned? Some people, they feel um, a calling from God or from the divine. If you experience something like this very strongly, as a few people do, it's like you don't have any choice. And then, okay, so you have to go in that direction, but there is so much that's unknown that it's, on the one hand, a very powerful calling, okay, you go in this direction, go in the direction of, of God, you can, okay. But um, then you still have to deal with everything just like everybody else, and you never know at any point where it's going to go. You have to make yourself a clean vessel so that as and when the divine decides, okay, now do something, be ready something is required, you can immediately shift into that mode. And then when that's finished, you become normal, but always ready. And you have to keep yourself very free. Uh, as human beings, we have um, choices to make on a daily basis. And I'm wondering to what extent is it necessary to look at the bigger picture? You see, we make choices for what's happening in our lives at this moment. Is it imperative that we take a step back and look at what is the impact of this particular decision on the rest of my life or on the lives of the people around me? I think it's very imperative. There are some kinds of people who are big picture people and they always need to see the whole picture and they're always looking in that way. 
they, they will be able to narrow down to some individual thing, but they'll immediately pull out and see the big picture. But there are many people who just don't do that. So I feel that there's a connection between people who are of the type who see the big picture and people whose decisions make a big difference on a lot of people's lives, you know, which means your uh, level of responsibility is greater you must pay more attention on yourself. And in some ways you could say that you don't belong to you, that you can just do whatever you want, but there's a, you could say a higher purpose or a higher destiny or something like this that is thrust upon you. And you have to rise to the occasion. As far as um, destiny is concerned, it has been said by a number of influential people that one's intuition leads you towards your destiny. Uh, what is your take on that? I think your intuition enables you to discern your destiny, maybe not take you to it. But on the other hand, if you can discern your destiny, then you will move towards it because it becomes visible as, you, know, you could say, the, the light at the end of the tunnel. You're going to go towards that light. I think if your destiny is discernible, it, it, has, it exerts a powerful pull on you and you just move towards that. You know, some people, they feel compelled. Mm -hmm. And you, you see this when you look at the um, biography of people who have accomplished great things. Uh, many of them feel or, or express this feeling of that they're compelled to do what they do, even if it's um, not appreciated, even if it seems a little insane. But if they hadn't been internally compelled, then we wouldn't have had the inventions that we had. You know, someone like Marie Curie did extraordinary work. Of course, being a woman, she doesn't get as much recognition as she would if she were a man. But um, she did extraordinary things, and she paid a very high price for it. So I think this question of paying a high price for doing something great is different from paying a high price for doing something bad. But you do pay a high price for doing something great, which is um, a quirk in the, in the laws of karma, I think. You often hear people use the expression, I had no choice, so therefore. That phrase, is it a cop-out? Or do people genuinely find themselves in that situation? I think sometimes it's a cop-out. You know, when people are cowards, they will say that. But, you know, when people had no choice to do something which required courage. Um, there's no cop-out. That is really what they were destined to be and do was greater than them. And sorry, no choice. This is you, you have to do this. Okay. It's almost as if there's some kind of voice from the beyond which uh, compels you. Uh, to what extent is it necessary to focus on uh, consequences? of uh, one's choice? Well, it's extremely important. You remember in another episode, we were talking about the three aspects of time. Mm. And in that, um, we're looking at what um, caused the current circumstances and what's going on. What are the different options and possibilities you have in the present moment? And when you're making your choice, you have to look at where this will lead to because you're responsible for the consequences of your actions. That last line that you mentioned, why is it so difficult for people to hold that in their awareness, to be uh, cognizant of it? Um, there are many on the planet who seem to be divorced from the real, their reality that their choices have consequences. And we willingly make the choices, but we run from the consequences. I think it's to do with being unwilling to be held accountable. 
And I think it's a very good attribute of spiritual practice or somebody who enters into spiritual practice to expect to be held accountable sooner or later for everything you do. And it is sooner or later. Sometimes it's much later. But all these things require what we may call moral courage. And I think the people who don't like to deal with the consequences are people who don't have moral courage. It's a rare thing. It's a good thing, but we can't assume that everybody should or would have it. And if somebody does have it, they're a valuable person. I think one thing that this does point out to is that people who are expecting to um, be held accountable, people who expect that there are many people watching them and will call them to account and hold them to what they say, these are very high-level people. But the world we live in doesn't give much regard to those people. It gives regard to people who are maybe more cowardly or less you know, um, deep, less wise, but maybe more flamboyant. As you say that, I'm just wondering, to what extent does conscience play a role in destiny, choices, karma? How does conscience fit into it? Conscience, to me, has a number of functions. One of them is that you can discern whether something is not just morally right or wrong, but whether it's correct for that moment, whether it is um, appropriate for what's coming next. Many, many aspects of conscience are there. So we need to um, refine, fine-tune our conscience I did a certain amount of research and I found that most people go against their conscience six, seven times a day at least, everybody. This causes the conscience to get blunt, to be dysfunctional, and so they cannot really use their conscience to arrive at perception and awareness about important things that the conscience could show them. And so then they will say, well, it's not possible to see these things. It is if you refine your conscience by listening to it. Mm. But people don't. In the course of my career, I've met individuals who I found cannot make a choice, who willingly allow others to make decisions for them. Why is that the case? And what is the danger that it, it entails? Some of it is because of their conditioning since children. And um, people who grew up in very dysfunctional families where there's very dominant, violent people, uh, it's a way of survival to just, you know, be compliant. And then they will extend that compliance in all parts of their lives. And this is a wound, a deep wound in the psyche. And um, I don't know to what extent the psychotherapeutic community is aware about this, but um, especially when people grow up in very extreme religious um, environments, this is very often the case because um, it's really drummed into you from birth until God knows when that, you know, if you're not compliant, you will be um, seen as an outsider and you will be uh, punished for it. This is something that was very strong in the um, 17th century with the witch burners. This was absolutely that. And so everybody had to be compliant on pain of death by torture. And so it created this very damaged psyche which may persist over a few births. Civilizations or societies that think this is good, because it's, it's not, it, it violates very important spiritual laws, it violates the laws of human rights and so on. 
So they will have to pay the price. It's a tyranny, you know. Uh, tyrannical people um, create these compliant um, sheep. So, as far as making choices that work for you are concerned, as opposed to those who work against you, uh, what qualities or virtues uh, does one need to emerge to make choices that um, stand you in good stead in your own future? I think you need to be very down to earth about the way society is. Uh, don't be a perfectionist because that's never going to work. Don't be an idealist, that's going to fail you. You have to be very grounded, very pragmatic, and um, find a way that you can fulfill your highest ideals within practical limits uh, so that you can make whatever compromises are inevitable and essential, but uh, always try to um, protect yourself from cowardice. There's a difference between being cowardly and being intelligent, because if you just stand in front of a bullet like a target, what's the point? Mm. You know, you need to get where you need to go. You have to be careful because you have to do it in such a way that you can actually succeed. I've um, encountered people who um, are not lacking intellectually or in any other way, but who doubt their own decision-making skills. And therefore, it's not that they do not make choices for themselves, but um, second-guess the choices that they make. Well, this is an attribute of trauma, because a person like that will have the signs of early childhood trauma, where they are, um, you know, shamed or blamed or told they don't know what they're talking about. It very often happens with people who are highly gifted, very, very intelligent. The people around them are ordinary. The ordinary people, when they encounter someone extraordinary, they want to destroy them. And those extraordinary people are very sensitive and may be quite um, fragile because they're so gifted. And the people are very happy to destroy them because they're different. And that's uh, a, a shame in our world, but it, it's there. I see that we're almost at the end of today's episode. So what parting words of wisdom do you have for somebody who is um, in the process of making um, either a small yet impactful decision or a life-changing decision? Um, how should they approach the subject of destiny and choice? I think it's again to do with taking time going into silence, trying to feel yourself, aspects of yourself that are not immediately accessible, but which come accessible when you're really deep. Then you have to be really very honest with yourself. Mm. And for that, you have to really separate yourself from everybody else so that you're just you with yourself say, okay, this is the right decision, so that's clear, but then how will you implement it in such a way that you can actually get it to happen, because you may need to navigate hostile territory, and so be willing to do what is necessary in a hostile environment. And I think one thing that eventually plays out, in my experience, is that if you do have the courage of your convictions, sooner or later you will be recognized for who you are. But in the meantime, um, you have to survive and don't allow um, people to uh, put you into so much self-doubt that you, that you perish, you know. Hmm. There you go. 
Thank you for joining us for today's episode, the subject of destiny and choice. I hope you found something in this episode that was of personal relevance to you, and I do hope you have taken some benefit from it. Thank you, Sister Denise, for your words of wisdom, and thank you back home. We hope to see you again soon. Take care and goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.